All right, I'm showing uh, 1130 Central, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Philip Davis, I'm director here at Geotech Center. Uh, today, we're going to do our first of the fall professional educator webinar series. And so, in the next 50 minutes, we're going to spend uh, t some time together talking about e learning programs in um, geospatial. This fall, we're going to be looking at uh, the geospatial e-learning, uh, a changing landscape, I call this. And we're going to have a series of webinars focused on uh, the rapidly changing e-learning e landscape in geospatial technology education. It's something I think a lot of us are experiencing. Uh, each webinar, we'll look at a slightly different aspect of the e-learning landscape. And we hope to feature the best practices and exemplary programs, uh, such as one you're going to hear this morning. Just to give you a, a bit of an idea of what's coming up, on uh, Tuesday, November 27th, after we get back from Thanksgiving, we're going to have a program uh, called Design and Implementation of a Distance Education Course on Open Source Web Mapping with Drs. Beren Coben and Ivana Ivan, Ivanova from the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Um, they've got some really innovative work that they're doing over in, uh, in Europe, I think, that is applicable to what we're trying to do here. On uh, Wednesday, January the 16th, we're going to have a program entitled Introduction to Phosphorgy in English and Spanish, a Bilingual Approach to uh, Teaching by Dr. Rafael Moreno from the University of Colorado at Denver. Uh, so those will be programs that we have upcoming uh, the rest of uh, th this, uh, this month. Goals for today's webinar. We hope to increase educators' awareness of changes in the e-learning related to geospatial education, demonstrate some of the best practices in both pedagogy and uh, technology, remote access technology, highlight innovative academic programs, and basically provide an awareness of tools and techniques for implementing e-learning programs in geospatial technologies. A lot of what we'll talk about here really is applicable to uh, uh, different technologies. We could be talking about AutoCAD or maybe Cisco networking. Uh, but the focus is on the e-learning um, component of it. So some tips for today. Uh, turn your sound to a comfortable level. We are using the audio over the internet, so I hope everybody is hearing this at this point. Uh, you might want to mute, uh, mute your uh, microphone to prevent any feedback, even though I don't think uh, we've enabled audio uh, to receive audio from you. You might want to maximize your browser window for the desktop so you can see the screen clearly. Uh, keep chat relevant to today's webinar, please. We will, uh, we will allow the chat room to remain uh, visible. Uh, ask questions. We'll get those uh, as we can. And uh, our presenter, Rich, uh, does not mind uh, doing interactive questioning. Uh, and also, please com uh, complete the uh, short survey at the end. And we are recording today's webinar uh, for later playback. What I'm showing you here is uh, our registration. These are the registrants from Eventbrite. We had 75 people register for today's webinar, most of which want to uh, listen to the recording. But you can see we cover pretty much coast to coast there in the US. Internationally, we even have uh, members from uh, Southern Europe, uh, the Middle East there, Africa, and South America. So this is a, a fairly wide ranging group that we're going to be talking with here. I'd like to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Rich Schultz is Associate Professor of Geography and Geosciences at Elmhurst College, which is located in uh, Illinois. So Rich, would you like to go ahead and uh, get started? And I'll bring your, see if I can bring your share up here, OK? All right. Thank you very much, Phil. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to you from wherever you're logging in to us. Uh, I want to welcome you to the first in the series of the Professional Educator webinar brought to you by the Geotech Center. I want to talk a little bit today about the design and development of an online GIS certificate program that we've designed specifically for working professionals at Elmhurst College in suburban Chicago. Um, I want to do a little bit of an intro here first and a little bit of a bio so you know a little bit about me and um, what I've been doing here at Elmhurst College. We'll learn a little bit about some of the pluses and the minuses of putting a program together online. And hopefully, we can share some of those pitfalls with you so that by the time that you're actually putting something together or maybe have already experienced this, uh, that you'll avoid some of these various types of drawbacks. 
And we'll learn about some of the necessary technology and the pedagogy or, or andragogy for such an online type program. Um, we'll talk a little bit about a particular niche audience and what is reasonable to be able to offer in terms of an online program. We'll learn about uh, a program that's an example of this and some of its details. And finally, we'll learn about why life experiences should be part of the equation here when we're designing an online certificate program or a degree program. I'd like to, at this time, acknowledge the National Geospatial Technology Center, the Geotech Center, and particularly Dr. Philip Davis for his efforts in uh, all the work that he's done in the geospatial industry. I'd like to point out my gratitude to ASRI for their support and also to the Elmhurst College School for Professional Studies and their Office of Adult and Graduate Admission. We will be archiving this webinar and the PowerPoint also will be available. Uh, the Geotech Center will make it available. I suspect that will be uh, for your download. I've also archived it on my particular website so you'll be able to, to access it at the address that you see on your screen right now as well. A little bit about me uh, without going into too much detail here. Uh, I reside in suburban Chicago. I've been uh, an associate professor at Elmhurst College in the Department of Geography and Geosciences for a number of years. And I'm the director of the online GIS certificate program at Elmhurst College. Uh, my ma major areas of, of emphasis are geoscience education, distance learning. Uh, I've been researching spatial cognition and spatial concepts recently, uh, geospatial thinking, and that's part of what's actually uh, been developed into some of the curriculum that we've used both in our traditional undergraduate program as well as our certificate program that you'll hear about today. Over the last several years, we've heard a fair amount about the geospatial industry and the Department of Labor declaring back in 2006 that there were three industries that they brought forth as high growth. Healthcare, number one, which is no surprise, nanotechnologies, which has certainly come to fruition, and geospatial technologies. I've left a, um, a URL up there that you can access to be able to read a little bit more about that. But suffice it to say that the Department of Labor has put a fair amount of resources and effort forth in being able to uh, promote the community and the workforce in geospatial technologies. Some of the occupations that you see in this particular chart, uh, which I must point out do not include uh, software programmers, which would add to this particular list. But essentially what we're seeing here is that the projected growth is significant in terms of the next 10 years or so, uh, with an average growth rate on some of the, the occupations in the geospatial information community, averaging 7 to 13%. Um, and as much as greater than 20% in some areas in terms of mapping technicians. Now this is projected growth over the next uh, 10 or so years, but uh, even though this is from 2008, we still have not seen any decline in that projected growth on the horizon. Our biggest challenge right now is that there seems to be somewhat of an oversaturation of workers going into, especially the STEM areas, but healthcare in particular. And because of the number of traditional age undergraduates and career changers that are going into the STEM fields, geospatial technologies is already starting to suffer a worker shortage. And it's projected that it will in the years to come. Presently, the jobs are already out there. In this particular area, I know that uh, from my perspe perspective, I have students that are required to have a geospatial internship before they matriculate through their undergraduate degree. Um, we've required them to have an internship in our undergraduate program um, because the internships are out there. Um, I'm getting a, a large number of internship opportunities that are coming across my desk. And I've had students that have had, at least in the Chicagoland area, interviews and offers for more than one internship position, which is a good problem to have. Uh, but for those students, uh, especially within the last year or so, we had a handful of students who have graduated and every single one of them, 100%, were able to hold down internships for at least a year uh, and 
were able to parlay those into full-time permanent positions before they graduated, which is exactly the way that we'd like to be able to see it. So most of these were paid internships. Um, I've only had a couple of uh, students that really wanted to be able to work at a particular locality or for a particular organization, and they accepted unpaid internships. The vast majority of these, um, as part of the culture around here, are paid internships where villages, municipalities, organizations have literally put it in their budget for the coming years to budget in for paid internships. So I th think these things are, are changing for the better in this particular area. We want to be able to get in on these employment opportunities, and the best way to be able to do that, I tell my students, is to learn something about the spatial perspective, how geographic information systems can be used as a tool to be able to solve many different sorts of challenges in a variety of different types of disciplines. And so the emphasis here is on those skill sets and what they can be able to apply in many different facets of many different workforces. So if I were to pass along a piece of advice to those educators who might be uh, contemplating building a program to put online, I would say that this is your selling point to your administration. The launching of a new online type program that can be interdisciplinary, that students can use these skill sets to become employed in lots of different areas should be a no-brainer for almost any administrator to be able to use this and uh, be able to launch a new program in this area. Uh, Trip asks if we're plugged into any professional organizations. Yes, we, of course, we have a relationship with the Geotech Center. Um, also within the state of Illinois here, we have a statewide organization, which is the Illinois GIS Association, or ILGISA. And that's an organization, fairly small organization in terms of membership. It's only about 600 or so uh, GIS professionals across the state. But we have a very good working relationship with uh, the folks that are part of that organization and also to be able to uh, get the word out about our students who are seeking internships and full-time positions. So that tends to work out quite well. Just to pass along some of the, the positives and the negatives, I'm, I'm sure that most of our audience is aware that in terms of positives, developing a program that's online opens up brand new target audiences. It makes the curriculum fully accessible on a 24-7 a basis and it also connects those folks that may never have been connected on ground because of geography. So we initially started our program as a hybrid, which meant that we were limited a little bit by geography because we would have students that would come in from the surrounding Chicago municipal area. Um, we changed that through time to make it fully online, and therefore we were able to have our students from just about anywhere be able to take a course where they could be able to work collaboratively with someone that they would never had the opportunity to be able to work with before. So I think that's a real plus there also. Uh, Tripp also notes that ERISA is headquartered in Chicago. Actually, that's just uh, down the road a piece from us in Des Plaines, Illinois. And we do have a working relationship with them as well um, in terms of our curriculum and our coursework being accepted for the GISP designation. So we've been in touch with them as well. Thanks for bringing that up, Tripp. Uh, as far as other positives, it's the online format is particularly convenient for non-traditional students. And that's for our particular program. That's, that's the vast majority of our audience that we see. We see a, a very collaborative cohort type format on a 24-7 basis where they're able to share scripts. That's one of the favorite things to do. They're able to be able to connect with each other on various types of problems that they're having uh, maybe a, on a municipality or a government level. So I think the ability to be able to provide for learning communities and interaction between our students is one of the pluses of uh, being able to uh, bring this in entirely online. You want to, uh, yeah, the, Phil's bringing up a poll here, and the, the question is, in the future, do you anticipate your courses will be delivered increasingly in distance learning format, remain campus-based, 
be adapted to the hybrid format. And if you could just go ahead and, and vote on that. They'll have a couple of people voting here. We'll wait another second or two. Okay, looks like uh, be delivered increasingly in distance learning format is about two thirds of our voters. So that's that's good to see. We're all on the same page here. Um, there's a number of considerations when we when we talk about online learning, and we'll go into just a few of those. There are positives, there are minuses. Some of the pitfalls are that we have to be able to deliver some technology and the software. Uh, can be a little bit challenging sometimes. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, making sure that your faculty members who are going to be providing the, the administration and the facilitation of the online courses um, know that and are cognizant of the fact that the pedagogy or the andragogy teaching to adult learners is vastly different online than it would be in an on-ground setting. And I think that's a very important consideration to know who our audience is and what it is they're desiring from uh, the online program. Is it, is it strictly for uh, personal enrichment? Is it something that they're going to be applying for um, their skill sets towards their job? Are they career changers? All those types of perspectives have to be taken into account. Uh, another pitfall is that in our program, it's an asynchronous program, meaning that there isn't a time other than, say, a given webinar when the students need to log in synchronously. Um, there might be a little bit of a delay, and that might um, ca pause a, a little bit of a challenge for some of the students who are used to receiving immediate gratification or immediate feedback. So that needs to be something that's... Uh, kind of addressed up front in terms of the ground rules and so forth. Um, academic integrity issues have always been on the front page of online learning, but technology is beginning to conquer that. Uh, our institution is using a third party now that is called ProctorU. And the way this works is students uh, essentially log in. And when they do this, they are given a special URL to log in. Their test is online. They are asked by the third party to have a webcam. When they do this, they show their ID into the webcam. They also show who they are and uh, by face recognition. They move their webcam around so that the surroundings can be seen. And then they're asked a series of four questions, at which point they need to get two out of four of those correct. And those are um, questions that are uh, only those particular students might know. Uh, those types of questions might range from um, anything having to do with the number of jobs that you've had in the past, where you've worked, um, that sort of information. Um, we think it works fairly well in terms of uh, satisfying the academic integrity and so forth. Now, we only do this with one particular exam in the course of a particular uh, semester. So that particular course that offers that. Each one of our courses would do it only one time, in other words. Um, so it's not done on every exam. So that's, that's one area that we feel we've conquered fairly well. Faculty development for online instruction is something also, and we're actually going through this right now. In order for our faculty to teach in our particular program within the School for Professional Studies at Elmhurst College, they all must go through a required online training. And the online training starts out with an orientation of the resources because there are some faculty that are part-time or adjunct faculty. And therefore, they need to learn a little bit about the institution as well so that they can pass that along to students. Uh, but I think it's a learning um, curve a little bit for them. And it's a good thing that they're able to be exposed to those resources here on campus as well. Um, even things that uh, they can provide for their students in terms of academics and advising and so forth. Um, following the four-week orientation, then it's more um, of a, of a uh, seminar that is geared specifically towards learning our learning management system. Uh, we used to use uh, Blackboard we, uh, for our GIS certificate program. We found that we're going to a new 
learning management system that is more in terms of teaching and learning and it interlocks the learning outcomes along with the overarching goals and the assessments and so forth. The learning management system that we're using is called Desire to Learn or D2L, uh, which has a bit of a learning curve for it, but it seems to be working quite well and the, the faculty are picking up on it quite well in terms of learning it. So that's the type of considerations that you'll have to take into account here. Um, really, do you have faculty who can teach GIS about GIS with GIS and learning the geospatial concepts such to the point that the pedagogy and the andragogy are instituted in a way such that uh, the students are going to get the maximum learning out of it. If not, is there an existing type of faculty development program at your institution that uh, they can become trained in online teaching. Uh, I see some comments in the, in the chat box there. Hardware requirements and desktop and mobile and so forth. Our students are pretty much logging in with just about any sort of device you can think of. Um, and I'm going to actually get to that in, uh, in just a couple of moments here when we're going to talk about accessing our dedicated GIS server and what we call BYOD, bringing your own device. Um, it's very difficult to be all things to all people, but I think technology is starting to conquer it to the point where we're able to accommodate lots of different users with lots of different devices. Uh, question from Trip about considering uh, CompTIA CTT Plus online instructor certification. We haven't at this point. We're doing it in-house. We're a rather small institution. So doing it in-house kind of makes more sense. And I have a better handle also on some of the things that I want to be able to bring into the GIS certificate program that I'm directing. So I think being able to have that closeness with my faculty as they're going through the training is an important aspect. Uh, the, the faculty being able to be trained in course development is sort of my next point. And does the institution actually have an instructional designer or an instructional technologist that may assist with this? Um, it's, it's been a real godsend to me to be able to have an instructional designer that can sit down on a one-to-one -one basis with my faculty members and myself and be able to provide some of the options. How do we want to be able to present this in such a way that the learners are going to be able to absorb the material and to be able to process it most efficiently? Um, do faculty know how to get the most out of the learning management system? And that's, I believe, what an in-house training would be for. So that's just a few of the things that you might want to be able to consider in terms of faculty uh, and their considerations. We had a poll here about faculty. Yes, uh, what does your organization provide in terms of, of faculty and assisting them in building their e-learning courses? I believe we can check more than one box here also. So do we have pedagogical training? Do we have instructional designers on staff? Looks like more than 85% of those responding have some sort of a, a learning management system, Blackboard, Moodle, Desire to Learn, something along those lines, and some training to go along with it. Looks like very few have nothing of the, of the um, options there. So this gives us a good indication that more than half of the institutions, or the responders here at least, uh, from their respective institutions, have instructional designers and some pedagogical training, which is a big help. I think a, a lot of this, the success on an online program uh, is your first line, and that's with the teaching aspects of it. Well, we also have to consider technology. Does your institution have the infrastructure technologically to be able to serve the software? Uh, are things in place? Um, not too long ago, we had some storms that went through uh, a number of different areas in the United States. Um, what were the backups there? If we had uh, a large storm that went through or something that was relatively minor, but maybe there was a power loss, would you still be able to provide that to the students? Um, 
even if power, say, went off with your main servers? Do you have a backup? How are you going to serve that software? Uh, do you have a dedicated server? Is it something that's off campus, that it's housed by a third party? Who handles the software, the hardware considerations on your campus? Do you need to be able to interface with the IT folks? And are they available 24-7? Uh, because the questions seem to come at 3 o'clock in the morning, not during business hours. Uh, you want to be able to provide a 24-7 access to your students because that's essentially what we promise them when we want them to register for our programs. Um, they're going to be able to access it anytime, anywhere, with just about any device. And the, the bar is being raised on that so that more and more institutions are having to be able to provide that for their, their prospective students. Is there a technical help desk or assistance not only for personnel and for students, but also for faculty? Because they're going to have some questions along the way as well. Um, while many times faculty have to play technicians, they don't always know all the answers. And sometimes the IT folks have the answers. Um, or have the passwords to things. So we need to make certain that uh, there's a, a clear line of communication there between those particular personnel groups. I want to introduce our, our Elmhurst College dedicated GIS server access. Um, this was actually dedicated to a student of ours. Uh, his name was George Stoyanov. Uh, back in 2009, George finished our program. And uh, he went back to his native Bulgaria after graduating in May. And he was um, killed in a car accident. And so he is memorialized in terms of our GIS server. Oddly enough, uh, his initials were GIS. So that is our George Ivanov Stoyanov server, GIS server. And it can be accessed for our students at gis.elmhurst.edu, which is a landing site for them. Students log in. They're able to take uh, the applications, receive the services through the dedicated server. It also serves as our data server as well. We have uh, very close to coming up to a terabyte worth of data now in terms of spatial data. And that's what it looks like. Uh, you can see that it's an ArcGIS desktop. The students can log in from this particular site just by clicking on the ArcGIS login. Once they log in, with a username and a password, which you see here through a remote desktop services, which we're actually changing because we're going to put uh, Cisco on top of the, the platform. So this will make it a lot easier for all types of users to be able to log in in the future, not just those through, uh, say, a PC or using a particular browser. So we'll be able to access everyone, no matter what their device is or what sort of uh, platform they're using. Once they're logged in, they'll see the new document screen, at which point they're able to log in to the dedicated server and start creating their maps on ArcMap. Um, we've found that in terms of uh, logins and in terms of uh, students who are accessing this concurrently, um, we have not seen any slowdown. And we've had anywhere between 75 to 100 concurrent users. So the nice part is, is that we can say that at least up to that many users, we haven't seen significant differences in terms of the redraws and so forth. Um, the nice part about that is, is that students can log in from anywhere. Um, they don't have to worry about going out and purchasing special hardware. The GIS server does all the heavy lifting for them, so they don't have to worry about that. So. Uh, when we were using Blackboard, this is just what a screen capture of the course management system would look like in terms of the, the software. So this happened to be a very easy way to access it on a 24-7 basis. Uh, some videos there and, and retrieving data and so forth. Um, normally, the, the modular structure that we have starts on a Sunday. And the reason that we started on a Sunday is because we have mostly non-traditional students. And that's a good time for them to be able to access and do a lot of their work. We keep a given module worth of learning open for an entire week until the subsequent Saturday night, at which time it shuts down. 
the entire module is archived for their later retrieval, but it's not shown except through a link on the left-hand side where they can uh, access the archive. That way it doesn't clutter up the in uh, interface and they're only working with the current module. That's what they'll see on the current uh, Blackboard setting. We work in terms of skill sets here in our program, and one of the things that was a real help to us starting in the summer of 2010 was the geospatial technology competency model. We decided to align our program with it because it provided a great foundation for not only the students and what their skill sets were in terms of some of the uh, traditional workplace skills all the way up to the more uh, industry-focused skills, but it was also a very uh, good tool for the employers to use to make sure that they were getting the types of people employ, um, employed in their organization and applying for their positions with the types of skill sets that they were seeking. So taking into account what sorts of skill sets and whether to align your program to the GTCM, I would highly recommend it. It's done a great deal for our programs. Using the geospatial technology competency model has put not only our students, but our local employers on the same page so that they can speak in terms of not only the personal effectiveness competencies at the base of the pyramid, but as we start to work our way up into the red and into the yellow, into the industry-wide technical competencies and the industry sector technical competencies following up into the managerial competencies, uh, everybody seems to be on the same page there. And there's going to be additional work in this particular area to not only fortify this, but to be able to quantitate it. Uh, in a certain respect so that we can even go a step further with this. So this is the model. If you're not familiar with it, um, I think I, uh, on the last slide there I had a, uh, uh, a URL for it. But the geospatial technology competency model was established uh, in a collaborative effort between the Department of Labor and the Geotech Center back in the summer of 2010. And going up in the levels, as I mentioned, a foundational level to industry related in the yellow and occupational related skill sets as we move towards the higher portion of the pyramid. There are relatively few uh, industries that have taken the time to be able to construct competency models. There's only a handful. I believe there's now around 20 different industries and geospatial technologies is one of them. So that tells me that the Department of Labor has put forth some thought and they've also decided that geospatial technologies in terms of a community and a, and a workspace is something that's rather important and is going to become continually more important in the future. So they've, they've uh, dedicated a fair amount of resources there. Uh, a little bit about our particular program. Um, I'm doing a, a little bit of a highlight here of what it's like, just a bare bones model designed for the working professionals. We also have a couple of uh, traditional age students maybe that are um, majoring in business or some of them are majoring in uh, other areas in the sciences that want to be able to supplement their particular skill sets and their discipline with some geospatial skills in problem solving and spatial thinking. So we do have a couple of traditional students. For the most part, we get career changers. We get folks who have been actually working in the geospatial community for a number of years. Uh, it's nice to have some of those folks in it because some of them have been working so long and have so much experience, they could probably teach some of our courses. They do such a terrific job and have such a vast amount of experience. They essentially are taking the courses so that they can have the educational component and have something officially on their transcripts such that when they apply for their GISP, they have that particular uh, aspect of, of the um, procedure met. But our program is entirely online and asynchronous and it can be completed in nine months uh, in certain instances. And I have to qualify that by saying that's for most students those who are career changers, brand new to the field, never used any type of software before, they would take our foundational course, which is a GIS 100 course, which eight-week uh, introduction to the geospatial community. 
before being admitted to the full cohort. Um, there are four courses after that that are required, which include remote sensing types of, of techniques, uh, a Python programming course along with customization, uh, working with geodatabases in terms of implementing and constructing their own geodatabases, and then finally a practical capstone course whereby the students work with a GIS professional and they're able to actually work with them collaboratively to solve their own problem which they design. Many of our uh, students actually take a problem that they're working at, say, at their job and try and solve that particular problem. So it has uh, a lot of meaning to them to be able to work with the GIS professional and solve that. Some of the questions that we often get are, well, what's, what's so special about a certificate? Why should I do a certificate type program? Uh, in comparison to maybe a degree program, those are out there. Uh, a four-year commitment is required to be able to complete a baccalaureate degree, and perhaps two years is required for a graduate degree past that. That's a significant amount of resources and a significant amount of time that's spent for someone who just may need to be able to brush up on their skills or may need to be able to enter into the geospatial community and transition effectively. A lot of the certificate programs are post-baccalaureate, uh, meaning that a degree is required upon acceptance into the program. A good example of this is Penn State's post-baccalaureate program. Um, certificate programs are usually geared for those who don't have four years worth of time, large sums of funding to be able to commit to some sort of a four-year program or a degree and perhaps even an additional two years past that for uh, an advanced degree past the undergraduate. So a, a certificate program is more of the fast track. It's for a specific type of audience who's very interested in getting into that. Um, the skills that are needed to succeed in the geospatial industry are something that we pay particular attention to. And more and more employers want their employees to have some programming skills, especially uh, for customization in Python. And they're seeking those with some sort of experience that they can display, that they can be able to provide during perhaps the interview process where they can display a portfolio that they've demonstrated that they can actually uh, have these skill sets with geospatial problem solving and thinking. And um, Trip asks about web or mobile apps. We have a separate program, actually, separate certificate program for web and mobile apps. And that's actually just coming online here in February of 2013. So that's a completely different area that's taught by our IT folks. Um, incidentally, the uh, programming courses and the geodatabase courses were something that when we first started our program we did not have those as part of the curriculum and we asked the students and we asked the employers what is it that was necessary what was it that was needed or that was lacking in our program and they immediately came back with Python programming and being able to work with geodatabases and customization model builder that sort of thing so we put it in our program. We worked with the IT folks to be able to do that. Um, teaming up with the IT folks was something that was a very good match for us. Uh, I know that doesn't happen in every instance, but it was something that really added the little extra to our program that employers wanted. And that was something that uh, sort of put us on the map in terms of our, our particular program. Having worked uh, in, in this program for about six years now, um, when I talk with students, when I talk with employers on a, on a regular basis, I ask them what's needed. And again, that's one of the ways that I found out that we actually needed some programming and some geodatabase, some IT type courses and customization. But I started making a little laundry list here. If a student were to be shopping for online certificate programs, um, I advise them to be able to ask the following types of questions here. Is Python programming part of it? Uh, does a practical capstone course 
have something that using spatial skill sets to be able to solve some sort of a problem and work with a GIS professional is that part of the equation. Uh, what is the access like to the software? Uh, does it mean that students have to go out and purchase the software on their own? Do they have to install software on their own machine? Do they have to go out and purchase new hardware to be able to do that? Uh, is there an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one faculty expertise at a small liberal arts-based institution? We're fortunate in that uh, most of our cohorts are only about 15 to 20 students, which we feel is the right size that the faculty member and the students who are in the courses can effectively communicate and be able to um, have one-on-one -on -one conversations if necessary as well, including on, on, um, on campus if some of the students are local. But most of the time it's through Skype sessions and uh, it's through sharing desktops and so forth. How long has the program been around? Uh, have they had an opportunity to sort of develop to a a changing marketplace? Have they uh, experienced some of the pitfalls like we have in our particular program to be able to make those corrections and rectify and be able to improve the program to address those particular issues? Uh, is the program aligned with the geospatial skills that are present in the GTCM? I emphasize how important we thought it was to have a foundation for that and to be able to have the students recognize what those skill sets were so that the, they could be able to speak to those as part of their e-portfolios and speak with the employer as to what the employer was seeking um, as far as a potential employee in the future. And they could all be talking the same language and on the same page as far as what those skill sets are. Uh, speaking about faculty and their experience as online educators. Do they use teaching methodologies that are based appropriately on either pedagogy or andragogy for your non-traditional students? And is the program priced competitively, of course, to be able to compete uh, with others that are offering the same sort of program and also to be able to, for the students to complete it in a reasonable amount of time? Uh, we don't want to keep the students there longer than they have to. Um, one of the, the uh, considerations that we have is for life experiences, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But this is just a quick rundown here on the slide that you see in front of you. Our coursework, they're all eight weeks in duration. Folks that are brand new to it or ha do not have experience with the software, uh, they have to take the GIS 100, Introduction to Geospatial Technologies, eight-week course. The other course uh, work after that is taken sequentially and it's one course at a time, so each is eight weeks. Remote sensing techniques followed by GIS programming, implementing geo databases, and then finally the capstone course. So if a, a given student were to begin, say, in February of the coming year, uh, they would be able to complete the program by December of the same calendar year. Just a little bit of a rundown on what those uh, ISG or information systems courses are. The G there is for GIS. We have uh, other courses in the IT program that have the same prefix as IS, so we called it ISG for GIS. In the IS100, it's a very basic look, introducing students to co computer programming of Python and the distinction between functional-oriented and object-oriented programming. We introduce them to Model Builder and its interface and in creating geo processes and writing scripts. So it is literally an introductory first course out of the box for those who have not been exposed to that particular uh, skill set before. And in terms of a skill set, that is part of the GTCM also to have some IT and script writing skills as well. Once the students successfully complete the uh, ISG 100, then they move on to the ISG 200, at which point we take an in-depth look into the design and development of a Microsoft Access database, which is uh, something that uh, a number of our students had not been exposed to before, and we find that it's necessary to be able to start them on the, with the same skill sets with Microsoft Access. Uh, then we move on to an overview of SQL, SQL Server, and 
for use in manipulating and writing queries and so forth. A uh, question comes in from Ty about remote sensing, including LIDAR. Yes, it does. In fact, that's one of the, the primary um, focal points of the course is introducing them to various remote sensing technologies and some of the uh, current technologies that are being used. And LIDAR happens to be um, a focal point of our curriculum uh, for that course. As I mentioned before, uh, programming and geodatabase courses are required because those are something that the employers are looking for. Those customization skill sets are exceptionally important for especially smaller organizations that need to customize. And to be able to advance in their field also having those skill sets. Our, our first iteration of our program did not include that. And when we asked our participants and their employers what's needed, that was the response. So we listened to it, we added it in, and uh, we certainly think that it was, it was uh, something that was a, a definite plus for our program. Another way to make your particular program attractive, especially to non-traditional students, and if you take their perspective of things, um, they're looking for entrance into a program that, A, they're going to be able to afford, certainly, because many times uh, the tuition is not paid for by employers. There's very little financial aid for non-traditional students that's available. So they want it to be able to be reasonably priced. They want it to be able to be something that's done fairly rapidly. They want it access 24-7. They want to be able to work at a fairly significant, quickly, uh, quick pace. And they also wanted to get the much, as much credit as possible upon entering the program. They want to be able to uh, know for a fact that um, uh, they're going to be able to carry these into uh, these skill sets into the course without having to retake a course. And one of the ways that we've introduced this into our program is by teaming with the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, or CALE. Uh, there's a website address in yellow there. Um, why should those students have to retake a course if they've already had life experience that have addressed those? Um, we found that that's a big plus to be able to get students in that have credit and can receive college credit for life experiences that they've already done. And I'd like to run a little poll here about um, life experiences. Can we bring that poll up, Phil? Terrific. Would your organization consider accepting non-credit courses if they're recommended by an independent third-party organization such as ACE or CALE? Give just another moment or so for everyone to finish up on the voting. Looks like about half of our audience uh, is not really sure about that. I would recommend that you look into that with your institution to see if that's something that might possibly work into the the equation for you because what it does is it it sets the tone for being able to have some empathy for those students and again why why make those students retake courses when they've already been doing something let's say in in their job for a number of years why take another course on that um, a lot of the students will say well if I have to retake that course maybe I just don't need to take it here I can take it somewhere else, or maybe another program will waive that for me. So I think that's a, a particular consideration. So just a little bit about Kale. Um, basically, you can use your particular input. For example, I'm mostly interested in whether our incoming students have any experience with the GIS software. And if I make that particular designation one of the requirements, and we, they ask that question upon admission into our program, then that helps to be able to make a decision. Uh, whether those students can have a course waived or more than one course waived or come in with some credit. So Kale will use the input that you have, say as a program to director, and be able to make those formal decisions based on those life experiences so that the students are able to get some credit. Uh, the nice part about this is that not only does it save the students some money, but it draws other students in if they know that this option actually exists. People will come in saying, well, if my friend got this particular uh, life experience and got credit for it, 
maybe you'd provide some credit for this. And the nice part about all this is that it's done by a third party. It's an involvement where uh, the program director does not have to make this formal decision and essentially be the point person on this. They can provide input, they can provide guidelines to Kale. Kale makes the final decision. So you can kind of look into this a little bit and see if it's right for your institution. I'd also recommend that when setting up an online program that you make the admission process as simple as possible for the students who are coming in. Have an application, say visit the website. We have a designated online application, which is just one page. Have them completed free. Um, once that comes in, then that information comes to me directly as the director of the program, and I can immediately make a decision whether that student is going to be admitted to the program, whether based on their responses to the questions that we ask, and also it goes to our CALE uh, personnel who can look at whether life experiences uh, can provide those students with some credit coming in. It usually, the de entire decision happens within the course of one day. So that's how quickly we can actually turn it around now. We have the students directly contact our Office of Adult and Graduate Admission. We don't require college transcripts because a high school diploma is all that we require for our particular program for students to be admitted. Uh, Phil asks, do I know which enrollment management software Elmhurst uses? Right now, we just set up our own so that it goes directly into our administrative system, which is called Datatel. Uh, but as far as the admission process, the one page, we've just done that in-house so that we could customize that to what it is that specifically we need for those students who are interested in the GIS program. 10% uh, of the first tuition payment is made by the start of the course, and then we, we collect the rest of the tuition after that. And it's a very simple process for our students. And I think that's one other thing, too, that makes it uh, very easy for our students. And it makes it a positive experience. So they know that their things are going to be able to be turned around very quickly. There's not a lot of red tape here. In terms of the tuition and the fees, uh, they're competitive. But you have to be realistic also, because uh, institutions, for the most part of our type, uh, while we're not for-profit institutions, we still need to be able to make some revenue on it. So for our particular academic year, we charge $5.75 per semester hour, and each three-semester hour course is $17.25. So the entire program can be completed for less than $7,000. There's no application fee. It's through an accredited institution. We're part of um, the Department of Education from the state of Illinois and the Higher Learning Commission, the HLC. Uh, we're a member of the North Central Association of Colleges and Schools in, in uh, Illinois. We advertise our tagline as personal attention because we are a liberal arts-based institution, low faculty student ratio, collaborative learning, and building learning networks and learning communities is part of our equation here. Um, education that's taught by experienced professional educators. Like I said, all the online faculty receive training. It's a total of 14 weeks worth of online training that they go through before they even uh, can have access to an online course. So it's a, it's a, a background in not only the uh, learning management system, but also in the teaching aspects as well. Threw in a map here of our Elmhurst College program students for 2012. Uh, we do also have some international ones, but I focused on the ones here in North America. And you can see that we get a, a fair number around the Chicago area, but it's a, a fair scattering, geographically speaking. We would never have been able to reach those students had we not had an online format. And we also have some students who are stationed overseas in the military also. So this is something that uh, we can particularly target. And they benefited greatly by uh, the, the curriculum that we'd offered and in such a manner that they can easily access it as well. So with that, I think we still have a moment or two for questions here. There's my contact information. Please don't hesitate to contact me. I'd be glad to 
you know, have a phone conversation, um, email if you prefer. However you'd want to be able to contact me, I'd, I'd be glad to, to share some further experiences with you and uh, hopefully be able to guide you in the right direction. Uh, our goal here is to be able to educate students for their successful transition into the geospatial community in the future. And so we're all part of the same team here. And uh, with that, I think we'll take some questions, Phil. Yeah, Rich, thanks very much for that. That was very informative, excellent presentation. Uh, I have enabled everybody's audio. Uh, there is an audio setup wizard. If you bother, uh, want to bother to go through with it, you can uh, uh, go to the audio setup wizard up there on your menu. And if you have a microphone, uh, you are able to um, you're able to go ahead and uh, pick that up if uh, you'd like to talk, or if you just want to enter it into the chat window there. Phil, I'm going to go ahead and answer Chris's question. He says, do you have uh, different rates for in and out of state? And the, the answer to that is, is that we do not. We have just one rate because we're a private institution. And, and I know with state schools, it certainly works differently. And we have the luxury of being able to essentially in a private institution, we just basically charge whatever we want. Um, I'm starting two other programs that are coming up in the future. Um, one of them is going to be a graduate program in um, applied geospatial science. That should be on the horizon within the next uh, six to eight months or so. And I've got another program also that's going to be serving some uh, secondary educators. And they're going to have different pricing structures based on who the audience are. So we're fortunate in that that respect that we can be able to uh, design our own tuition structure. But I know not everybody's able to do that. Uh, Francis asked Go if we ahead. had an opportunity to speak with students after they've worked for a while. Uh, feedback from alumni, yes. As a matter of fact, most of our students uh, that we've talked with are local in the Chicago municipal area. And we have a small users group, it's called the uh, Illinois Municipal ARC Users Group, or IMOG, and there's, I don't know, maybe about 100, 150 users that are in that group, and uh, a number of them have been through our program, so we have access to being able to get their input, and we assess them through time, you know, two years out, three years out, five years out, what skill sets do they need, what is changing, um, and we've had fairly good feedback with how the students have succeeded in uh, successfully transitioning into the workforce, that they had received the type of training, the types of skill sets that they needed to be able to not only successfully secure full-time employment, but be able to sustain that employment and move up in their occupation as well. I think Sean had a question there. Summarize the delivery of the curriculum, lecture, exercises, projects, interaction. Yeah, Sean, all of the above. One of the things that we're particularly interested in is the learning modalities or the learning styles of students. And while there is a lot of inner uh, uh, overlap between the way that the content is presented, we present screencasts, which are voiceover lectures. We'll present the PowerPoints so that the students have access to them. We have readings. We have exercises. We have webinars on a weekly basis so that students can get their questions answered. Uh, we have discussion forums so that they can trade scripts, things of that nature. We have lots and lots of practical exercises. And if we're able to, we can even customize some of the exercises if we have localized data. We had a student from Portland, Oregon one time that had uh, access to an absolutely rich data set from the city of Portland. And we were able to customize some exercises and solve some problems for that particular student. Great experience. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're able to get in touch with these students on a variety of different ways. And since it's presented in a weekly modular format, there's the constant back and forth between the students, the instructor, uh, the instructor serves more as a facilitator than anything else and a, and, a, and a guide and a mentor to be able to help the students through things and get them the resources that they need to be able to complete and to learn uh, what's in the curriculum. Anyone else like to ask uh, Rich a question here on his online program at Elmhurst? 
I know Rich has got to leave us here pretty quickly. So if you have a question, uh, either uh, use your audio or uh, go ahead and just type it in the chat box there. Rich, do you have any uh, overseas or uh, out of country? Uh, we have both, yes. Actually, we've had a number of students uh, that were stationed in the military. We had uh, a student from Korea who was stationed. We had a student from Afghanistan who was stationed in the military. Um, and we also had an instructor at one particular point who was involved in homeland security issues. So uh, that was a very good fit because he had a military background and was able to speak the same language as some of the military students. So we were fortunate with that. He's um, teaching on a limited basis for us right now. But yeah, okay. we've had a number of students. And we, we haven't found that there's really too much of a, of a problem there with different time zones and forth, uh, back and forth. Um, there's always Skype, first of all. And secondly, um, you know, we always worked it out in such a way that those students were allowed a little extra time depending on where they were located for submitting assignments and so forth. And it usually works out quite well. And Francis had a question there for you at the bottom. Do we cover web design issues in courses? We just touch on web design in a, in a very uh, small way just to make the students somewhat functional with doing that. Uh, we're going to a curriculum that's including much more in terms of web mapping, of course. Um, I think that's an important skill that, uh, and consideration that be taken into account for any program as we do more and more things in the cloud and so forth. So um, I would say in, in terms of basic skill sets, we address that, but it's not in any great detail. We have an entirely different program for web design that's taught by our IT folks if students are more interested in that. Another thing that we're doing and that I would highly recommend is that if there are other adjacent programs or connecting programs that might be offering elective courses, we're open to accepting those as well. Um, and we're going to be starting a, a, a whole new school in terms of professional studies at Elmhurst College in February, we've been trying to put this together for the past year or so, and there's a great amount of cross-fertilization that's going to be occurring between a number of different programs, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level, as well as certificate level. So we're finding that students, for example, in our um, supply chain management program want to take some courses in being more functional with using GIS as a tool in their area. So there's a lot of cross-fertilization that I think is a very healthy thing. Program uh, for educators here is another question. Uh, share a little bit about that. Yeah, we're actually going to be starting a graduate certificate program for uh, teachers who are teaching AP Human Geography. And without going into another uh, round of details here, because that's a whole other webinar, but um, we're going to be starting that uh, in the summer of 2013, where we're going to be offering uh, courses that include spatial thinking and spatial cognition for the teachers so that they can weave into their ninth grade curriculum. Most, mostly that's when AP Human Geography is taught a lot about the spatial concepts. So we're hoping that's going to provide more in the way of future geospatial workers as well. Uh, the, the new geospatial management competency model, yeah, ERISA has been working on that a little bit. And um, that will be part of our program as well. I, I just couldn't talk about everything in the limited amount of time I have. But absolutely, I think that's, that's certainly part of the equation as well, Tripp. All right. Well, Rich, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate everybody showing up today. Uh, we will have our next webinar, uh, November the 27th. Uh, I put our URL down there, geotechcenter.org. If you'd like to click on that, you're welcome to take a look at our calendar. So uh, from the Geotech Center, from Elmhurst, uh, from Rich and I, thank you very much for everybody coming. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.